We have quorum. I call to order this meeting of the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology. I would like to begin by welcoming members of the committee, our witnesses, and members of the public watching our proceedings. My name is Ratna Umifar, Senator from Ontario, and I am the chair of this committee. I would like to begin by doing a round table of introductions from senators, starting from my left, the vice chair of the committee. Patricia Bowlby, senator from Manitoba. John Nebraska, senator from Ontario. My apologies, Francis Lankin, senator from Ontario. Wanda Thomas-Bernard, senator from Nova Scotia. Elizabeth Whitey, senator from New Brunswick, welcome. Grant Kucher from Nova Scotia. Jean Gio Sir from Manitoba. Shara Zuer, Senator from Ontario. Thank you, colleagues and witnesses. This will be, this may be a bit of a truncated meeting. It's unusual for us today, but we have votes in the Senate and bells will be rung, so senators will have to leave. We will suspend the meeting so that we can go and vote and resume after the vote is concluded. And this may happen twice. I'd like to thank you for your patience and forbearance and for, thank you for your flexibility and understanding. It, I hope it is not too disruptive. Today we continue our study of Bill C-22, an act to reduce poverty and to support the financial security of persons with disabilities by establishing the Canada Disability Benefit Act and making a consequential amendment to the Income Tax Act. I would like to take a moment to remind those participating in today's meeting, as well as those observing the proceedings in person and on video, that the committee has taken steps to allow for the full participation of all witnesses and members of the public in the, con in the context of consideration of Bill C-22. In planning inclusive and accessible meetings, the committee has made arrangements for sign language interpretation in both American Sign Language and Quebec Sign Language for those witnesses appearing in person and for those in our audience. The sign language interpretation will be video recorded and incorporated into the archived video recording of the proceedings, which will be made available at a later date on SendView via the committee's website. Finally, if a member of the audience requires assistance at any time, please notify one of the pages or the committee clerk. Joining us on our first panel is David Crone, Executive Director with Cerebral Palsy Association of Manitoba. Janelle Shaw, Executive Director with Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba. Sid Frankel, Associate Professor, Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. And by video conference, from Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture, Jenna Reed, Artistic Director, and Kate Blake, Administrative Director. In the interest of being efficient with our time today, Ms. Shaw and Professor Frankel have kindly provided opening remarks in writing, which were shared with the members in advance of the meeting and will be distributed in, in the room. We will begin with opening statements from Mr. Crone and Ms. Reed, following which I will give Ms. Shaw and Professor Frankel time to respond briefly before we proceed to questions from senators, if you wish to. I remind Ms. Crone and Ms. Reed that you will each have five minutes for your remarks. Mr. Crone, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, senators, for this opportunity to present on Bill C-22 the Canadian Disability Benefit. My name is David Crone and I am the Executive Director of the Cerebral Palsy Association of Manitoba. As part of my duties as Executive Director, I sit on several different community committees that deal with both poverty and disability. I am the President of the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg and in the disability community, I am a member of the Disability Matters Vote Steering Committee and sit on various other coalitions. I want to thank the Parliament for providing a national benefit for working-age Canadians that have a disability. 
The Canadian Disability Benefit is a generational change in order to lift individuals with disabilities out of poverty now and in the future. Thank you. I also wanted to thank the committee members and the Senate for listening and considering some important yet simple changes in addition to the Act that will make it stronger. First, I want to highlight that Bill C-22 is rooted in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the UN Convention and the Canadian Human Rights Act. My members are not looking for charity. We appreciate that this benefit is based on human rights because disability issues matter for all Canadians. Secondly, I would like to talk about the interaction between other benefit programs. The Manitoba Court of King's Bench found in 2022 that between 2005 and 2018, Manitoba clawed back more than $330 million in children's special allowance benefits from Indigenous children in the child and family services system. Provincial clawbacks of federal benefits are a real risk and should be addressed in the bill. Currently in Manitoba, an individual on EIA collects between $823 per month in general assistance, up to $1,278 per month for those with severe and prolonged disabilities. As you can see, all of these levels of income do not come close to the cost of living. As stated in the preamble, provinces do take the lead on disability benefits, services and direct supports. I am concerned that given the history and the potential for clawbacks, both in income and wraparound benefits, that the Canadian benefit, disability benefit needs to be protected. We need those benefits both provincial, provincially and federally to be stackable so they can actually make an impact on disability and alleviate poverty and give recipients a dignified and fulfilling life. The next question is how do we do this? And there are two steps that I want to, to bring to your attention. Step one is in section three, the purpose of the act. This needs to be more than one sentence. The bill has ambitious goals that need to be reflected here. The purpose of the act needs to be more specific with a benefit level, more than just basic needs in, as food security and housing. There are also additional expenses to when living with a disability, transportation costs, social inclusion, social opportunities are some examples. In the purpose of the Canadian disability benefit, the need is to give a certain certainty of the federal government goals and to discourage provinces from interfering with the achievement of those goals through their own social benefit programs. The importance of having clear and specific purpose of the act is twofold. First is to discourage the provinces from making clawbacks to benefits. This enhanced purpose will give guidance to the courts and parliament in the future of the intention of the act if there is a dispute between federal and provincial jurisdictions. Second, in section 11, the regulations, the, a lot of the details of this act are left to be developed in the regulations. Having a more specific detailed purpose and some general goals in, select, in section three will help guide and create a better Canadian disability benefit. Step two, the federal government already has the tools to protect this benefit if parliament does not want to change the bill with an amendment. The Canadian social transfer does have the ability for the federal government to withhold an equal amount of funds transferred to the provinces that claw back benefits. However, in order to avoid long and expensive court challenges, a change within Bill C-22 is preferred. In Section 9, Subsection C, this benefit already has been protected from clawbacks with other federal benefits. So you have already made that, that point. In closing, I'd like to thank you for listening. Canada is a very wealthy country and we, need, we, we all need to value its citizens, including the 6.2 million Canadians living with a disability. In the past, we are looked at as a burden, a cost to society. Given all the proper supports, we can achieve more, live more, and add to the economy, to the society, and to the workforce. And in order for the Canadian Disability Benefit to achieve its goals for the next generation, we need to start today to work together no matter what the jurisdiction with no clawbacks and a clearly defined goal and purpose with Bill C-22. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crone. Ms. Reed, your five minutes, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jenna Reed. My pronouns are she and her. And when I introduce myself, I like to reference the late psychiatric survivor, Diana Capone, in saying I'm a woman who wears many hats. 
I do this because it speaks to my community accountability, speaking to a lineage of knowledge, activism, politics, ethics, and political organizers and community members that I have learned from. The hats that I wear are artist and arts administrator. I'm coming to you in my role as the artistic director at Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture. I'm an activist with over 15 years of organizing experience in the psychiatric survivor community, as well as doing frontline cross-movement solidarity work. I am an academic with a PhD in critical disability studies, and I identify as a mad psychiatric survivor, queer, white settler, cis woman. I reference these particular hats because artists and, and especially disabled artists are in a very unique position in relation to poverty, and these perspectives des deserve to be heard. I have worked on the board of a social purpose enterprise that is built out of the psychiatric survivor community in order to create our own solutions to poverty, stigma, and various forms of marginalization. This organization believes strongly in the wisdom, value, and skills of people with lived experience of mental health, addiction, homelessness, trauma, newcomer, refugee challenges. These issues of poverty are intersectional. I have also done a two-year-long postdoctoral fellowship at the Dalai School of Public Health, specifically researching poverty and experiences of social assistance programs in intersectional 2SLGBTQIA plus communities with a heavy focus on disability. I think it matters to reflect within this bill that this bill is not enough. It's not moving fast enough, and it is clear to our communities that our needs and lives have not been a priority. Ms. Reed, unfortunately, we have to suspend. Interpretation is not working, and therefore, let's take a few minutes to figure this out. I apologize profusely. Colleagues and uh, presenters, uh, we've had a little bit of a change of musical chairs here, and uh, our chair has asked me as deputy chair to take over chairing the balance of this afternoon's discussion. Uh, to our presenters, I want to say uh, I'm very sorry we had the vote. I don't know whether you were able to see the standing vote as we were in the chamber. Uh, I can tell you there'll be another one coming up. So without further ado, um, colleagues, we've agreed that this meeting will run till 6.30. We hope that's uh, uh, all right for everybody. Uh, there will be no steering meeting following this meeting, and uh, we will continue. So with our translation issues, I'm going to suggest, um, I gather, Mr. Cron, you were able to finish uh, your remarks. I wonder if we could now move to... Uh, um, Ms. Shaw to give uh, a response, um, uh, a brief response if she could, and then to, uh, to Dr. Frankel if, if he would be so willing. And to our, our um, witnesses online, we're very sorry about the translation issue, um, uh, Ms. Reed. I understand that Ms. Blake is still online and will be able to answer questions or following the responses from Ms. Shaw and Dr. Frankel, uh, I don't know whether you're in a position to finish giving Ms. Reed's uh, testimony. I will say we've had this problem before and we will make arrangements to try to make amends uh, for uh, the issue uh, with uh, Ms. Reed. So without further ado, um, uh, are we looking at five minutes each, clerk, for, for, for Ms. Shaw? Uh, Ms. Okay, so up to five minutes for Ms. Shaw, and then up to five minutes for, for Dr. Frankel, and uh, uh, then unless uh, Ms. Blake wants to make a statement, we'll move to questions, colleagues. Honorable Senators, I thank you for inviting Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba, or AANM, today to be a witness and speak, speak to Bill C-22. I'm honored to be representing AANM and artists who are deaf and disabled at these important proceedings. We are speaking of issues that reflect our lived experiences of disability and our prof professional expertise. At a and we focus on supporting artists by providing professional development and opportunities to showcase their work. 
We also take on advocacy projects within Manitoba to improve access to the arts for all. As a result of disability, many of our artists are not able to work a full-time job, but an arts career allows them the flexibility to work when they are able on their own schedules. Unfortunately, much of the work available to artists with disabilities is most precarious in nature, in that it isn't about hours worked nor about salaried opportunities with benefits, but about honorariums or the art produced being sold. Through art, many of our artists with disabilities are questioning assumptions of normality and how the mind and body perform. Our artists use their platforms to increase the knowledge of disability and to dispel harmful stereotypes. One of our members, Adam Schwartz, uses comedy as a way to speak about neurodiversity. Those who attend his shows can expect to laugh and hear directly from Adam about his experiences living with autism. Alice Crawford, another member of AANM, is a hard of hearing artist who uses type and printmaking to express the obstacles in communications she experiences in her daily interactions. While many of our artists are working to improve their lives and the lives of others in the disability community through their important work, they live in poverty and struggle to make ends meet. It can be difficult for our artists to reach their full potential with the stresses of poverty and the lack of accessible and affordable spaces for them to do their work. It's also important to note the hidden or extra costs of disability which affect the community. For example, some folks need non-prescription medication, pre-cut food, or aids that are not or only partially covered. These additional costs force those with disabilities to pay out of pocket or go without these important supports. AANM is fully supportive of Bill C-22 to ensure that those with disabilities have the fin financial security they desperately need and to uphold the dignity of our community. Um, the impact of a national disability benefit would, afford, would allow our community to afford the basic necessities to ensure their health and well-being and to help cover the hidden costs of disability. This bill would ensure that artists with disabilities could continue their important work to create an inclusive and accessible future. While AANM does support this bill, we do have concerns. The bill explicitly states that this benefit is for those under 65 who are of working age. As we all know, poverty, poverty doesn't end at 65. For artists with disability, there is no retirement age. All artists continue to create work long into their senior years and are as deserving of financial stability as their younger counterparts. Another lack of concern, uh, sorry, another concern is the lack of information on the income amount people with disabilities should receive. Upon passage of C-22, guidelines need to be put in place in consultation with organizations of disabled persons such as AANM. This historic legislation will ensure a more inclusive and equitable society, but to guarantee the bill has the impact it's intending, we must ensure that Section 11.1 is, respect, is respected. The real experts of disability and poverty are those with lived experience. They know best what is needed to, for themselves to be financially secure, and we hope that Section 11.1 will be respected and enacted. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Honorable Senators for their invitation to speak about this important bill today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, colleagues, the lights are flashing. The vote will be at 508. And for our guests, these are, these are uh, supply bills. These are the money bills that, that we all need to get out there. So we're very sorry about this. Um, uh, Dr. Frankel, we have time for you to make an intervention. And colleagues, I'm going to make sure that we leave the room by 5.03 to get to the 5.08 vote. Dr. Thank you. Um, senators, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I speak to you with a lot of humility uh, sitting with um, my colleagues who are experts on disability. Uh, I do not have a disability, uh, but I think I can make some points uh, which will cohere with what they're saying. Basically, I've made four points, and I know that you uh, have my written comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I think the Act and regulation should take more of a human rights approach to poverty prevention and amelioration. That would mean guaranteeing the benefit of the right, uh, as a right, rather, uh, using the various human rights treaties to which Canada is a signatory as a normative framework, 
and the minister reporting required to report annually on compliance with it as well as with the charter. Uh, accountability measures, the minister also reporting annually on the rate, depth and duration of poverty among people with disabilities. Uh, a consideration of people with disabilities as a vulnerable, vulnerable group and trying to lower the risks that occur because of the intersection of poverty and disability. One way to do that uh, is to ensure that the eligibility processes and the appeals are accessible to all, that the Act should guarantee the technological and human resources required by some people with disabilities to render them accessible. Finally, uh, a human rights approach argues that people with disabilities must participate in the administration of the Act, not merely in preparation of the regulations. Uh, there should be something more comprehensive and more enduring. Perhaps a, a committee representative of all people with disabilities uh, that could monitor the implementation of the Act make recommendations for improvement, and respond to recommendations of others. Uh, second, the Act, uh, uh, the bill requires uh, the Minister to take account of the market basket measure, Canada's official poverty line, uh, in establishing the benefit level, which will of course then become the standard for uh, assessing how much poverty has been reduced by the bill. There are some problems with that. The way the market basket measure works, many costs are not included in the basket but are subtracted from income. Uh, I, uh, I recount them in uh, what I've written, but one of them is the cost of medically prescribed but uninsured goods and services. And uh, my argument would be that the benefit will be set too low uh, using the market basket measure. Beyond this, no, none of our poverty measures uh, take account of the additional costs uh, related to disability to have an equivalent standard of living of, uh, for those who are not disabled. And we have some recent research that I've cited that documents uh, th that uh, very fact with regard to the market basket measure. I'd recommend an adjusted low-income measure. This is a relative measure rather than the absolute market basket measure. Relative measures are much more highly correlated with health and well-being indicators. Uh, the market back basket measure would have to be adjusted. First of all, it also doesn't take account of the additional costs of disability, so something would have to be built in to assess those. And because the market basket measure is based on median incomes, it would go down uh, likely in times of recession and certainly in depression. So uh, I would argue that the last year before the recession or depression should be taken uh, as the benefit level. Uh, beyond that, uh, again, others have made points about clawbacks. We know it happens. It happened with the CERB despite very strong statements from the federal minister asking provinces and territories not to claw back. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the relevant act, the Federal Provincial Fiscal Arrangements Act, already contains a condition uh, that disincentivizes provinces from establishing a waiting period for the application for social assistance. Similar condition could be put in uh, with regard to clawing back uh, provincial disabilities. Are my, is my time up? Okay. And um, I thank you very Thanks. much. I really do apologize for this disrupted meeting, but I, I, I know you all know how the, the, the government business has to go on. Colleagues, I'm going to suggest, please, that we suspend while we go vote. The vote is at 5.08 and it takes about 10 minutes to do the standing vote and we will be back and we will then um, go into questions and Ms. Blake, I don't know whether you'd like to make a few remarks before we move to questions or wait for questions. Okay.
So we'll go into questions when we come back, and we'll start with Senators Poirier, Senator Osler, Senator Bury, and Senator Bernard to begin. <laughs> Colleagues and guests, we are back online, and there are no more votes today. <laughs> The chamber either has risen or is about to rise uh, uh, momentarily. So we will carry forward uninterrupted. Um, uh, colleagues, as I said earlier, uh, our meeting today will go to 6.30. We'll keep this panel going till 20 to 6. And that um, uh, the second panel will be from 20 to 6 to, um, sorry, 20, yeah, 20 to 6 to 6.30. Uh, I understand, um, Ms. Blake, that uh, you uh, would like to make a few remarks, and then we'll go to questions, and uh, at the beginning of the question period, we'll let you know how long you have for questions and answers. So, Ms. Blake, please. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm just having some sound quality issues. I think I'm getting some feedback from the Senate sounds. Okay, that Are seems to be it. Oh. No. Okay, uh, that seems to be better. Thank you. Um, I am just going to, hello, my name is Kate Blake, and I am the Administrative Director of Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture, and I'm going to just be continuing on um, with the prepared uh, notes that Jenna had had and unable to deliver due to the technical issues. Um, so to continue from where Jenna left off, uh, the, this bill does not adequately address the complexities of poverty. Poverty is not an absence of sufficient income. Poverty is built into social relations and power inequities built into our systems, our society, and our institutions. This bill does not address the sheer inaccessibility of the social assistance programs and the system and institutions, and does not attend to the discrimination and violence disabled people face within them. Uh, it does not account for how many are excluded or not adequately served, let alone the fact that it is dispor dispor disappointingly minimal in goal. The reduction of poverty still leaves our communities in dismal conditions. Um, Jenna approaches this feedback from a uh, point of an incredible privilege of being white, growing up in the upper a middle upper class and having a PhD in critical disability studies. And even though those in within those pieces, um, nothing in how Jenna and Kickstart was invited to, to come the, to this table adequately supported in giving the type of meaningful feedback as in every step of this process has been inaccessible from our point of view as disabled people. Nothing about us without us would mean that we take meaningful change in this bill at all stages. And currently we do not see how that has been built into this process. Um, but surely you all know this, um, you have been told this and you are able to understand that this is the very way that it is designed to go with a lot of performative inclusion when knowing that inclusion means that your table is set, dressed, and ready for service. And the best you might do is put a coaster under one leg to say, slightly improve the wobbles in a superficial way. The best that I, on behalf of Jenna and Kickstart, can say to you is that we don't see any meaningful attention given to the needs unique to disabled artists, the experience of the gig economy and unstable work, and the dismal ways in which disabled artists and arts administrators are funded and resourced. I do, we do not see any meaningful consideration for things like episodic disabilities, uh, nor the fault and inaccessibility process of getting adequate proof of being disabled or being disabled enough or disabled in the right way. Uh, there is no accounting for the influences of racism and anti-indigeneity in our frame of disability rights as well. And all of this to say is that to reduce poverty, we need to consider more than just the impact of insufficient income. Do, need, do we need more money? Yes. Will that fix the issues uh, in inequity? Absolutely not. 
um, that is the end of my statement. Thank you. Ms. Blake, I, I want to thank you very much on behalf of the committee, and I'd like to thank all our presenters on behalf of the committee. Um, colleagues, we have a little more than um, 15 minutes, so may I ask each of us to have uh, three minutes for a question and answer, and if we've got time, we can do a second round, and may I suggest that if I know sometimes we repeat questions and dig deeper. May I suggest in the interest of time, uh, we try to ask different questions to the best of our ability. Uh, so Senatrice Poirier followed by Senator Osler, please. Thank you. Thank you all to all the witnesses for being here. And uh, again, apologies for all the, the different changes that we had to go through uh, during it. My question is for uh, Professor Frankel. Uh, in your remarks, you recommended the Act should require an appeal mechanism and guarantee that appellants be provided with resources to support filing and arguing uh, their appeals. Applying for disability supports and appealing decisions is often heavy. Uh, given your experience, I'm wondering, is there a Canadian or an international example of jurisdictions that's doing a good job of supporting people with disabilities through that process? What should we be looking to, and do you think, the bene do you think that this benefit should be based on individuals or family income? Okay. <laughs> um, a few questions. Um, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, the effectiveness of various uh, approaches uh, uh, to, uh, to appeals. Uh, but uh, I do know, and uh, I think my colleagues can also speak to it, that uh, the support uh, that uh, is available for the appellant is important. Uh, and for example, when it comes to uh, employment insurance appeals, there is some support uh, available. Um, uh, but I think that's worth looking into, and it's uh, given me a good idea to look at where there are, uh, where there are effective appeal mechanisms. Um, the general approach in Canada in almost all benefits is to focus on household income. Um, and uh, the issue, uh, there, there's really two issues there. One is what income is taken into account in providing the benefit. The other uh, issue is who actually receives the benefit. So uh, I think it's been our tradition that household income is taken into account. It's based on the assumption that all household members have access to the benefits. Um, but I think the person with the disability should be the actual recipient of that income, not, not a household head if it is not the person w with the disability. Thank you. Given your research in the next little while, you come up with an idea. Could you please send it to the, the clerk? Because that will really help inform our work. Do I have 30 seconds left? Uh, you got 10. OK. If you were to make an <laughs> amendment in C-22, what would you make? Um, I think I would, uh, I would think that the most important is to have a more uh, enduring and comprehensive way for people with disabilities to be involved. So I would require something much more than being consulted on the uh, regulations, although that is important. I would argue for a committee established uh, that uh, is appointed by an all-party committee um, and has the mandate to monitor the implementation, to make recommendations uh, to, uh, to the minister, um, recommendations that should be to the entire uh, house, uh, and uh, also to uh, be consulted on recommendations made by others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Osler, Madam, followed, followed by Senator Bury. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of the witnesses for your thoughtful testimony. Um, I'll, I'll have a few quotes. So, Ms. Blake, you were talking about social relations and power. Um, Dr. Frankel and Ms. Shaw, you spoke of financial security and poverty reduction. Uh, Mr. Cron, you spoke about how the purpose of the act needs to be expanded. And my question is for all the witnesses. The preamble of the bill lists social exclusion 
as one of the reasons working age persons with disabilities are more likely than those without disabilities to live in poverty. In each of your opinions, how can the Canada Disability Benefit be designed to promote social inclusion? I think Dr. Franco, you spoke about that a little bit. How can it be designed to promote social inclusion for persons with disabilities? Sure. Can I ask you to please paint the video? Yeah, sure. I will, brevity is a good thing. So in the, the best part of it is that in the preamble in section three, it gives the weight uh, to the bill to give some actual definition and examples. So that is the really uh, important part. Um, yeah, I would agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Frankel said before, that uh, the inclusion of the voice of deaf and disabled uh, individuals, so I, I'm always thinking about artists, um, is really important. You know, we are the experts of our own experiences. We know what it's like to live in poverty and the extra costs that everything co that it, that we incur. Um, and so I think it's really essential to ensure that uh, we have full participation uh, in all aspects of this uh, planning. Ms. Blake? Um, yes, uh, I'm answering on behalf of myself and um, Jenna as well. So um, Jenna has indicated that inclusion needs to allow for addressing the power imbalance through participation. Um, and just personally, uh, as someone who is neurodiverse and lives with various um, intellectual and learning disabilities, uh, just the on my own research of learning more about this bill was incredibly inaccessible. Um, there was no lay term version available to me. Um, so you have to come in from a place of privilege and understanding to even understand um, all of the information and the nuances in the bill. And I, you know, I feel that that is a very important thing to point out. Thank you. And Dr. Frankel? I think the act should uh, describe the benefit as a right or entitlement uh, so that it does not carry the stigma of more contingent benefits like welfare. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, uh, uh, Senator Bury. Thank you to our witnesses. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your expertise. I'm going to um, just hone in on this issue of legislation versus, reg versus regulation and the permutations in between. We have heard from many witnesses who have one view, let's get this bill passed, don't, no amendments, it's going to die. So, you know, knowing that the majority of the Canadian, Canada disability benefit would be established through regulations, specifically orders in council, while clause 12 of bill C-22 establishes parliamentary reviews of the Canada Disability Benefit Act, the regulatory process limits parliamentary review of regulations to the standing joint committee. Now, in your opinion, um, on the majority of the Canada Disability Benefit description um, being determined through regulations rather than legislation, what are the potential advantages or disadvantages? Because we've, we've been hearing the two sides. Uh, to uh, either to all of the all I of our, our, our distinguished is, witnesses. I is our short? time is very tight, so okay. perhaps we could have um, <laughs> two people answer two people. this one, and another two can answer the, the next. I, okay. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Maybe um, sure. Mr. Grant. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be more than happy. So you know, uh, a, a human right can't be based on good intentions, mm -hmm. and the not having clawbacks need to be have the weight of law. Regulations can be changed at any time within council, privy council. So we really need to have those protections within the law or within the social Canadian social transfer. It doesn't necessarily, but somewhere that in the future we need to governments change uh, expectations and we forget why we are here today. And we really need to embed that into law so that we don't have to keep coming back every five years to fight for the same human right that we've already have. But, uh, 
Ms. Blake, would you like to respond to this? No, Ms. Shaw? I'll defer to my colleagues. Dr. Frankel. Just very briefly, I understand the tension. People with disabilities, many are living in terrible poverty right now, and we want to do this right. So I would argue that principles uh, like um, referring uh, to uh, the various human rights treaties that Canada has signed, uh, that should go into the Act, that they should be established as a normative framework, the minister should be required to report on compliance. Uh, thank you, Senator Bernard, followed by Senator Petitclair. And that, I fear, colleagues, might be the end of the time we have for this panel, given our interruptions. Thank you, Chair. And I don't think I'll, I'll I don't think there'll be time to get answers to my questions. So I'm tabling the questions, and I'll ask uh, respectfully for a response uh, later if you can. So my, my first uh, the question is to Dr. Jenna and Ms. Blake. You have highlighted the complexities of poverty and you've also talked about the intersectionality of poverty with indigeneity and racism and so on. And so I would like you, if you could, to uh, maybe send us some more of your ideas around what may, what may need to be amended in the bill to, to uh, ensure that we take account of the complexities of poverty. Because many people don't fully understand it, especially that piece of on exclusion. My other comment is really about what you've shared in terms of the inaccessibility of these meetings themselves. And I have to say, I want to put it on the record, that I feel very embarrassed that we've created a situation where we've invited you here and the, the meetings themselves are inaccessible. And so if you have specific recommendations for us for how we can do better as the Senate of Canada to be more inclusive, to create conditions where your voices can be heard, I would like to, to hear from you. We would welcome uh, your suggestions. Thank you. So I, I don't want an answer because I know we won't get it now. We don't have the time. But I, I want to invite those responses. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator, and very, very, very good points. Um, uh, Senator Petitclerc. Petit Merci beaucoup, Madame La. Thank you very much, Chair. And, and, and thank you, thank you for, for, for being here. Uh, very quick questions uh, in order to get answers. I'm very curious, uh, uh, Madam Shah, you talked about the, the complexity of being an artist with a disability, and I, I have to admit I, I didn't know much about it, and I don't know much about it, but you did mention the fact that you know it is gig economy, it's honorarium, it's small contracts. So, very quick question is: uh, in, in do you know if the um, art community for and with persons with disability have been part of the consultation up to now? Um, so that's my first question, and my other question may be for uh, Mr. Cron, uh, and if we have time, others is. Um, the bill calls for taking into consideration the poverty line. And what I'm hearing more and more is that this will not be enough. Like we need to go beyond the poverty, like way, I, I'm, that's what I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So, so I would like to hear you about that, but maybe uh, on consultation first. Right. Um, so I'm not aware of any consultations at the moment, but I think it would be very important because it's very difficult for artists when, um, even when they receive honorariums, they uh, they're at uh, there's a chance that if they put that check in their bank, they can get kicked off a disability and brings a lot of stress to our our members. So I think it's really important to be able to, if if it hasn't already, speak more to artists with disabilities to understand the complexities of going through these different systems we have and how it affects their poverty levels. Mm, thank you. And in speaking with the, the poverty levels, I'm going to defer to Dr. Frankel, mm -hmm. but the one thing I am going to say is if you double the benefit that people get in Manitoba right now, they're still below the poverty line just to put it in a little context. Mm -hmm. 
So very briefly, none of the poverty measures take into account the additional costs related to di disability for an equivalent standard of living to those without disabilities. Something has to be done about that if you're trying to limit disability, uh, poverty among people with disability. The market basket measure has a technical problem, uh, what's not in the basket, uh, and that will lead to setting too low uh, a, a standard. Mm -hmm. Can I? Do I have 10 seconds? 10 seconds. So, because <laughs> uh, I want things on the record, huh? would you all agree, it, it's a yes or no question, that no matter the disability, living with that disability comes with extra cost? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. There is evidence of that, yes. <laughs> Blake, do you agree with that, or do you? Uh, yes, I do. I'd also like to just um, uh, answer the bit about uh, the engagement of dis disabled artists. Um, Kickstart has been in uh, a professional di disability arts organization for 25 years, and we do not feel that we have, uh, we as the art disability arts community have um, had a part in this in a meaningful way up until the invitation um, on, to this particular hearing. Thank you. I want to thank you all. Oh, yes. Can I just add one take on that last question that Senator Pedicler asked? Uh, very briefly, does that change when you hit the magic age of 65? <laughs> For the record. For the record, yes. You're cured at 65 because your benefits <laughs> go away. Um, and that's why they need to be stackable. I'll, I'll send the Senate a, a bit more of information so you can consider it. I, I'm, I'm, again, really apologetic and embarrassed that, that this first panel this afternoon has had the interruptions, technical and two votes. You've been very gracious, very generous. Um, we would love to receive more information to dig deeper on any of the things you've said. And I'm going to ask the clerk for the, our colleagues who time ran out and they didn't have a chance to ask a question. Could you send your question to the clerk so that we can forward it to the panel and get the response? Um, this, is, this is about inclusivity. It's in, about getting questions on the table to the best of our ability. So if we can do that, um, colleagues, I'd, I'd really be very, very grateful. And again, to panel one, thank you for your graciousness, your information, and for coming. And you're welcome to stay and listen to panel number two, uh, which will start in just a minute. So we will suspend colleagues while we get panel number two rolling.